بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بأحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد in the previous session we talked about Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een immigrating to Eritrea, to Habasha and then, and that was in the fifth year of Nabuwa which means five years after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam received his prophethood and people be started becoming Muslims And we also talked about the Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een coming back to Makkah Mukarramah after hearing some rumors. Then some of them went back, the rest stayed in Makkah Mukarramah. But of course they could not take all the hardships that the Muslims had to go through in Makkah Mukarramah and therefore they had to leave again but this time there were about 83 people who left to Habasha to Eritrea. When these 83 people left the Kuffar of Quraysh knew about them and they learned that these people are living very peacefully in Habasha, in Eritrea. So the Kuffar of Quraysh decided to send two people to talk to the king, as I said, whose real name was Asmaha, but he was known as Najashi. So they sent two people over there to talk to the king to send these people back. What's the purpose of trying to get these people back? The only purpose is so that they can torture them and force them to turn away from Islam. Now these people are not hurting them. They live out of country. They are living somewhere else in the world. The kuffar cannot even accept someone, a Muslim, living peacefully anywhere else in the world. So the thing that is hurting them is the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't want that deen to exist. And this is why they send these people to bring these people back to Makkah Mukarramah so that they can torture them and they would try their best to force them to turn away from the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amr bin al-As radiyallahu anhu who was not a Muslim yet he is the Sahabi who conquered Egypt Amr bin al-As radiyallahu anhu and Umar bin al-Walid these were the two people chosen by the kuffar of Quraysh to be sent over there very briefly to understand who these two people were Umar bin al-Walid we talked about him before that once the kuffar of Quraysh went to Abu Talib to offer him a replacement for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they said we will offer you Umar bin al-Walid because he's a very handsome boy the one that they can compare to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of course they can't find exact match to him but they can see if anyone is very handsome next to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that is Umar bin al-Walid so they chose him because by his luck, he can impress the king and the people around the king. And number two was Amr bin al-As radiyallahu anhu, who was not Muslim, as I said, at that time. He was known as Dahiyatul Arab. 
one of the most intelligent people of Arabs. Very extremely wise person. And sometime when you read about him, and you read how he used to study people by looking at their face, by hearing few words from them, he really used to get to the depth of that person's personality. And many times, he would inform people of what others may do in future. And in future, it so happened that that person did exactly the way Amr ibn al-As anhu thought that this person would do it this way. Dahiyatul Arab. Very intelligent person. And when it came to planning, in the worst and the most difficult situation, when normally person's brain and mind gives up, he used to think so fast and come up, come up with such a plan that will just surprise the people and will get what he likes to get done. So they chose these two people. These people went over there and first thing that it was, they had a lot of gifts for, from Makkah Mukarramah to offer people, to offer the king and people around the king. So they decided not to approach the king until they have given gifts to all the people around him so that those people will be under control. So they started giving gifts to all of those people. They spent some days doing that. And after giving them these gifts, they'll talk to them that we have some people who have run away from our country. They are living in your country here. They don't follow your religion anyway. And these people have run away from their, their, from their fathers and they, they were considered to be the bad people of the community. Now they are going to spoil the atmosphere in your country also. And with these type of things, that what we need from you is that once we talk to the king, all we need from you is that you help us getting these people back and you approve what we are saying and so that the king will send these people back to Makkah. All of those people agreed after receiving these gifts. Then these people went to the king. And again, they did the same thing. They offered a lot of gifts to king. And started mentioning whatever they were there for. And finally, they asked for these people to be sent back. As soon as they said this, King asked other people's opinion, all the people around him, and they all started saying, yes, we have no room for these type of people in our country. Just send them back. In fact, we should arrange for them to make sure that they take them back to their country. We get them into the boat. We tie them up. We send them back to their country. So the king, just to let them know where they were making the mistake, he asked them, where do these people live? They said, they live in this country. He said, then you people need to know, and he was very upset when he was saying this, that you people need to know, and he's talking to his own people, not to Amr bin al-As or to Umar bin al-Walid. He's telling his people, you should understand this and keep this in mind. How can we send people who have taken refuge in our country without talking to them? Have you talked to these people? Have you met these people? Have you told them what these people have against them? And just like this, without talking to them, you are uh, thinking of sending them, back, sending them back? Impossible. I won't do that. Amr ibn al-As, this intelligent man knew that if the king would talk to them, that's it. He may not send them with us. No matter how intelligent he is, he knew, and uh, because of intelligence, he knew that I cannot make up things that will make him send them back after he would listen to them because haq is haq. Truth is truth. Once he would hear the truth from them, the fear is he may even be impressed by what they have to say. So he tried his best for the king not to talk to those people and just send them back. 
freaking said impossible. I won't do that. If these people have trusted me and they live here in my country, I have to talk to them first. So he sent a message calling all the Muslims that were living over there. Sahaba Ridwanullahi said that was a very difficult time for us. We started thinking what to say and finally they unanimously came to the decision we should just say everything that we have been taught by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and things that we believe in no matter what that will cost us. Ja'far radiyallahu anhu said I would be the spokesperson for all of us. I don't want anyone else to speak. And they agreed that Ja'far bin Abi Talib radiyallahu anhu will be the spokesperson for these people. When they went to the king, they did not bow down for the king as it was the normal situation. People used to do sujood for the kings in those days. Amr bin al-As right away found an excuse so that the king will be upset with these people right away. He said, see, these people don't even have respect for you people. They live in your country, they live in your land, but they don't have no respect for you people. They are not bowing down for you. The king asked him, asked Ja'far, because he was in front and the rest of the people were behind him. So he asked him, how come you did not bow down for me? Ja'far radiallahu anhu replied, because we are Muslims, we perform sujood only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our Prophet taught us that not to bow down before anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the king asked him, what religion do you people follow? I heard that you left the religions of your forefathers. And you don't even follow my, my religion. So what religion are you people follow, following? Ja'far radiallahu anhu at that time gave a khutbah. That khutbah is considered to be one of the very important khutbahs that we have in the collection of the khutbahs. A khutbah that was so impressive that after hearing it, not only the king, the king and other followers who were bribed before, they all were crying hearing this khutbah of Ja'far radiallahu anhu. He said, Ayyuhal Malik, O king, we were living in total ignorance. We used to worship idols. We used, we used to worship stones and consider these stones as partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We used to eat dead animals, commit all kind of crimes, and indulge in all kind of shameless acts. arham. We used to break our relationships. Nusi al jawar. We used to be very bad to our neighbors. Yakul al daif. That was a normal situation that every strong person will take advantage of weak people. And will misuse those weak people around him. We had no shame in doing wrong and harm to any person around us if we had the ability to do that. And we continued doing all of these things until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent this messenger to us. Who taught us to be truthful, to be trustworthy, not to worship idols. Not to associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He told us to be nice to weak people. Not to consume and eat up the wealth of the orphans. He ordered us to perform salah, to pay zakah, and to fast for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He told us that lying, cheating, Breaking the relationship, hurting others was one of the worst crimes. We loved those teachings. 
we believed in him. We started following him. We gave up all of those evils that we used to do. People around us who were worshipping these idols did not like these deeds. Did not like us giving up these evils. So therefore they started torturing us. They started punishing us for believing in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They tortured us so much that we couldn't take it anymore. We couldn't live with that anymore. We decided that we have to leave that country. And at that time, we thought the best place to go for us would be to come in your country because we knew that you are a just ruler and we knew that you are a person who follows the right thing, whatever you know about the truth, you try to follow that. You don't do wrong to people in your country and you're to your civilians. Therefore, we chose to live in this country. But now our people, they don't even like us to live peacefully in this part of the world. The only reason they are here is so that we go back and they can torture us. We have not done anything wrong to them. We have not killed any people over there and run away. We have not taken their wealth and run away. And we have not done anything wrong to these people. Ask them why do they want us back over there. The king was very impressed. He said, your prophet got any divine book also? He said, yes. He brought a divine book to us. He said, can you recite something from that to me? Ja'far radiallahu anhu started reciting some ayahs of Surah Maryam. From the beginning of Surah Maryam, some narration says when he stopped, the king asked him to recite even more. And he continuously kept on asking him to recite more. Until he finished the whole surah. At that time, by the time Ja'far radiallahu anhu finished reciting the surah, the narration say that all the people were crying. Najashian people around him were crying, crying so much. His beard was soaked with tears. He said, This is the same thing that Allah sent to Musa alayhi salatu was salam. I see the same light that was that came to Prophet Musa alayhi salatu was salam. Whatever you have said is very true. I cannot do anything wrong to these people. You people live wherever you like to live. I'm not going to hand you over to anyone else. There are some reminders here. That I will talk about once we are done with it. But one thing here that we need to just remind ourselves. Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'in deciding to say the truth at that time. Whereas if they wanted they could have made some words. There weren't too many practices of Islam at that time. Ibadah did not, was not even there at that time with, except with Nawafil. Most of the ibadahs were optional at that time. But still the Sahaba Ridwanullahi Ali Majma'een unanimously agreed and decided. They have their families with them. They have their wives with them. They have their children with them. They are not thinking what will happen to them. What will happen to our children. What will happen to us. We have to say the truth. Because of that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the barakah in their words. And their words became so impressive that the king decided not to hand these people over to the kuffar of Quraysh. When these people left, Amr ibn al-As started using his mind now that I have to do something. I can't just go like that. So he said to Umar ibn al-Walid, tomorrow I'm going to play a trick. That will make sure that the king not only will send them back, he will even torture them himself. And the next day, he went to the king and he said, I forgot to tell you one thing yesterday. What was that? He said, you don't know what these people say about Isa alayhi salam. They insult Prophet Isa alayhi salam. They say that he was not son of God. 
Now, he called them again. So all the Sahaba were asked to be over there and they all went. Again, Ja'far radiallahu anhu was the spokesman for them. And they again decided that we'll have to say the truth, no matter what happens. We will say the truth. The king asked Ja'far radiallahu anhu, that what do you people believe about Isa alayhi salatu wasalam? He said, we believe in him only what our prophet taught us, and that is that he is a messenger of Allah. And then Ja'far radiallahu anhu recited some ayahs about Isa alayhi salatu wasalam to the king. Of course, the first day, the king was not of Arab descendants. They had their own language. And there was a translator there. The next day now, when Sayyidina Ja'far radiallahu anhu recited some ayahs of Surah Maryam to the king that were about Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, and that were talking about him not being son of God, instead was a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the king said, this is exactly the teaching of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. Whatever these people believe in, these are the true teachings of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. At that time, people sitting around him, especially the priest and the rabbis or whoever they were sitting around him, they started making some noise to show the king we are upset. You shouldn't make these type of statements. He's son of God. King looked at these people and said, that no matter what you people think about it and how upset you people get with me, whatever these people have said is the truth. And he was a messenger of God. Then he said to Sahaba Ridwanullahi Ali Majma'een, go and live wherever you like. And now he made a rule, Man Sabbakum Gharim. Even if a person curses any one of you in this land, in this country, that person will have to pay a ransom for it. He said to his people, give all of their gifts back to them. فَمَا أُحِبُّ أَنَّ لِي جَبَلًا مِّن ذَهَبْ وَأَنِّي آذَيْتُ رَجُلًا مِّنْكُمْ He said to Sahaba Ridwanullahi Ali Majma'een, even if I'm offered a gold equivalent to a mountain, mountain of gold, to hurt you people, I won't hurt a single person out of you. I won't accept even a mountain of gold to just hurt one of you people. Then he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I did not have to bribe Allah to give me the kingdom. Allah gave me the kingdom without me having to bribe him. So I'm not going to accept any bribe for rejecting the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why did he say this? There is a story behind it that I will come back to it in a minute inshallah. But since we are not studying a history, this is part of the history, but we are studying the seerah. The seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we need to learn this from that point of view of studying the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What is the difference? The difference is history. We have known that this thing happened in the history. Did that really affect our feelings? Did our feelings change at this time while we are hearing this story? Most probably no. We heard this story. We learned that these people had to leave their town. They went to Habasha. They lived over there. But could you imagine what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam may have been going through at that time? What were the feelings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he sees that now this large group of people had to live this country. They will go and live somewhere else in the world. They don't know how they are going to make it over there. These people are leaving this country. They have to leave Mecca because they can't live here anymore. 
and the only blame they have, the only reason these people are being tortured in Mecca is because they believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They follow Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's about 45 or 46 years old then. And he had to make this decision that, okay, you people don't live around me now. You have to leave me. How difficult it is. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loves his ummah and especially his followers. He loves those people more than any mother or father can love their child. And his concern about them is more than what parents' concern could be for their children. But he had to come to this decision that you people leave here, leave Mecca. Go and live over there. We don't know what will happen. We, Inshallah, Allah will help you. But imagine today when we travel. Or if our children are leaving town. What is it that we do for them? Make sure that you have your credit cards with you. You have this money. You have this passport. You have these special banks for, with you. You keep this food with you. Subhanallah. With all of this, everything that is available for us all around, we are not going to a place where we are handed over to our enemies. We are going to places that are known to us. We are going to places where we know that we can live in hotels. We can live in motels. There are restaurants. There, are, there is all of that there. We carry our money with us. We carry our ticket with us. We carry our return ticket so we can come back in case of anything. We have our cell phones with us. We have so all of these facilities. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sending these sahaba ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een at a place where they don't know when they will arrive there. After arriving, where they are going to live. Who is going to accommodate them over there? They have no houses. They have no relatives. They have no friends. Totally new place. Strangers. Different looking people. They are going to go and live over there. Who's going to help them? Where are they going? To? Okay, after some time they may build houses for themselves. But where are they going to live initially? They have their families with them. They have their young children with them. They have some pregnant women with them. One of them delivered in the boat, in the ship that they were riding to get over there. With all of the situation, just imagine what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was going through at that time. The difficulties, the hardships that brought this messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wa that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had to go through. This is something that we learn from the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he's sending them not for a business, not for pleasure, not to go and have a good time over there. He's sending them only to be able to practice the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This hijrah is solely for protecting their iman and their faith. Nothing else. We really need to sit by ourselves and think. Words cannot expl explain it. And there is no way that you can express these feelings in words. The feeling of a father who knows the son have left to a place where he doesn't know where he's going to live. He doesn't know where he's going to eat from. He doesn't even have enough money with him. And he's going over there to live, who knows, maybe forever, to even die over there. How he's going to make his living? He doesn't have a business. He doesn't have a trade that he's going to use over there. None of these things. This, of course, was a concern of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he's sending them. But the the situation is so difficult in Mecca that they can't live over there. So he had to make that decision. You people have to leave Mecca. May Allah be with you. May Allah help you go over there and live in that part of the world. 
until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will find some other way for us. This is something that we have to think as fathers, as children, even as children, think if our parents have to live somewhere else in this situation. If our parents will have to leave our comfortable homes, the homes that we have been living in for years, and we have all means of comfort, and all of a sudden a situation, God forbid, changes, and parents will have to leave the home. We will live peacefully in those homes, but our parents will have to leave, and will have to go and live at a place where they won't be able to have any work. Initially, they won't have no work, where they don't know how they're going to make their living, where they will be straight, exactly, they will be just on the street. They will be on the street. And then they will have to find a way that at least somewhere they can, a place where they can have a little rest during the night time and do some work, maybe cleaning people's home, maybe washing dishes at people's homes, maybe doing some of any of these type of works just to make their living. What will be the situation of the children who know that their parents are leaving home and they will be living in that condition, in that situation? And no connection. They won't be able to call us. We won't know what situation they are living in for years and years. This was the situation of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now we learn what is it that this messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wa salam had to go through for presenting this deen to us. The deen that we are taking it for granted. And I like to remind again and again that we are not learning history, we are learning seerah. We want to learn what is it that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was going through for preaching this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how did we get this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So anyway, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in Makkah Mukarramah, always hoping to find, somehow find a way of getting some information about these people that are over there. We need to also remember his own daughter is there. Rasman radiallahu anhu went there with his wife. The daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But of course his concern is not only his daughter. His concern is each and every believer there. Each and every person that had to leave the country. And now of course the situation is getting even worse. When these people are sending these people. The other, uh, sending people to the king. To try to bring those people back. Throughout the time. From the time when he learned that these people are making this plan. And now two people have left Makkah until these people came back. And that was month. Imagine what could have been the situation of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is what he is going through. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, he wanted to help his deen. And through the prayers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, through the dua of Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een, the king did not accept to send those people back. One of the statements the king made was that Allah, I did not have to bribe Allah for giving me the kingdom. And that was because this king Najashi, his father was the king. He had an uncle and his uncle had 12 sons. Najashi was the only son for his father. So the people around his father thought that after this king will die, then his son will take over. But who would take over after his son? Then we will have wars and we will have difficult situation. And normally when there is no one out of the brothers to take over, out of the, these children to take over, then normally we start getting uh, into wars and misunderstandings. So they, saw, they thought it will be the best to kill this king, of course, that was Asmah's father, to kill him and then assign his brother as a king because he has 12 children. So one after another, those children, those uh, children of uh, uh, Asmah's uh, uncle, 
they will start becoming the rulers of Eritrea one after another. And the king, they killed his father. After killing his father, they realized that Asmaha is getting too close to his uncle. And their fear was that Asmaha was very intelligent. And therefore his uncle used to trust him in everything and would take his opinion in everything. And he knew that these people have killed my father. So their fear was that if he will become king next, then we will try to take revenge from us. So let's try to kill him also. So they talked to his uncle that, you know, he's getting too close to you. And we are afraid if he would become uh, the king next after you, then he will try to take revenge from us. So we would like you to kill him, get rid of him. So he said, you know, you killed his father. I won't accept you people killing him now. We will send him somewhere out of the country. So they sold him as a slave to a person from somewhere else, from some different country. When that person was taking him with him, during that time, while that person is still, he did not leave the country. And this king, his uncle died. So of course they wanted to assign one of his children. He has 12 sons. So he, they wanted to assign one of his children to be the next ruler. But none of them was suitable to rule the country. So they decided that the best is to go and bring him back. So they went to bring him back. They brought him back. They assigned the kingdom to him. That person who had bought him, he said, then pay me back for whatever I paid you people. They said, no, we are not going to buy our king. So we won't even pay you back. So he knew that now he became the king. So he went and approached him. He said, these people, at least they should pay me back for what I paid for you. So he got these people. He called those people and he said, that was the first ruling he came up with after his kingdom. That either you pay him back or this person is going to take his slave and I'm still a slave. I will go with him wherever he would take me. So when they heard this ruling, right away they paid that person back. So this is what he was referring to, that I did not have to bribe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give me the kingdom. He just gave it back to me. All the people did not want it for me, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it to me. So I'm not going to obey people regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now. Of course, he was very impressed with what he heard from Ja'far radiallahu anhu from uh, the recitation of Quran al-Kareem. Meanwhile, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent a letter to him inviting him to, the, to Islam. So when he received the letter, he wrote back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Islam was in my heart. And now since you sent me this letter, you be my witness that I bear that I bear witness that there is no, none to be worshipped by but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I believe in you as a messenger of Allah. And he became Muslim. Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een who were living over there. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam immigrated to Medina Munawwara, some of these Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een left at that time and the rest of them went back in the seventh year of Hijrah or the sixth year of Hijrah. Inshallah we'll talk about it as we will get to that period of the seerah. But at that time, Najashi wrote a letter to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the sixth year of Hijrah just to confirm that he is Muslim and saying to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that I'm willing to come to you. I really feel like coming to you. If And he said to Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhi wa sallam, if I get an opportunity to go to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I will be honored to carry his slippers for him. This is the king. I will be honored to carry his slippers for him. And this reminds me the word of King Hercules when he received the letter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and those words are in Sahih al-Bukhari. He said, if I can get to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I would wash his feet. But of course for him it was only words and he did not become Muslim 
because of his kingdom, Najashi became Muslim. And at that time, he said to, uh, he asked Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that if you want and if you order me, in spite of this kingdom, I'm willing to give it up and come and live with you and be in Medina Munawwara with you. But of course, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam wanted him to live over there and continue being over there. Najashi, when he died, of course, at that time, no Muslims were there because all the Sahaba Ridwanullah had gone back to Medina Munawwara. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam performed Salatul Janazah on Najashi. And before that, he had got a message through Ja'far radiallahu anhu saying that, Ya Rasulullah, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam right then made a dua, Allahumma ghfir lahu. Ya Allah, forgive all of his sins. He, made, he said it three times. And when he died, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhi wa that today this great man have died and there is no one to perform janazah over there for him. So we are going to perform janazah over here for him. And he said to Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhi wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has removed all the things between me and him and I can see his janazah in front of me. So now you make your safuf behind me. And this was a miracle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And of course at the same time, a gift for Najashi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he helped the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He helped Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhi wa He helped Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And for the sacrifice that he was willing to offer, that Ya Rasulullah, if you ask me to come and live with you, I'm willing to give up my kingdom and come and live with you Ya Rasulullah. Subhanallah, this is really the deen. This is the iman. This is the faith. That once you believe, he said, now you ask me for whatever you need, Ya Rasulullah, I'm willing to, to offer every sacrifice for you. For the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here he's getting the gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when a person does something for Allah, for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it never goes wasted. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam performed Salatul Janazah. This is the only Salatul Janazah that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam performed on a person that was not present in front of him. Of course, miraculously, he's present in front of him. There is another situation that we find in the hadith, but that hadith is very weak that talks about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam making Salatul Janazah on one more person uh, without that person being present in front of him. But that hadith is da'if. This is the only authentic hadith that we learn in which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did it. And miraculously, all the things were removed out of his way. And really, one thing is that we see it as a miracle that everything was removed. The other thing we can see that these feelings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for Najashi, the feeling that he had for him that this man really helped my sahaba. I'm very grateful to this man. He helped my deen. He helped these people who went to him. So now, you can imagine if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is having that feeling and he wants to make that janazah, there is nothing in the world that can stand before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and be between him and the janazah of that person. Even things have no guts to stand in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when they see that feeling of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhim ajma'een, they were living there peacefully. The kuffar of Quraysh could not take that. They started torturing the people of Makkah even more. And because of that, once even Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu thought of leaving Makkah Mukarramah and going to Habasha, going to Eritrea. When he was leaving and he left the Makkah, on his way he found one of the leaders of Quraysh whose name was Ibn al-Dughunna. Ibn al-Dughunna asked Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, where are you going Abu Bakr? He said, you know, the people of Makkah are torturing us. They just forced us to leave the town. I can't live in this town. So I'm going to live somewhere else to be able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Abu Bakr, a person like you can never leave and should never leave. And even people are, should never force a person like you to leave their town. You are an honor to our town. Come back and I will give you the full protection. No one will be able to harm you, Abu Bakr. 
At that time he said, Ya Abu Bakr, innaka tuksibul ma'doom. You financially support the needy people. وَتَصِلُ rahim, You join the relationship. وَتَحْمِلُ kal, You carry the burden of the destitute person. وَتُقْرِ ضَيْف You serve the guest. وَتُعِينُ عَلَى نَوَائِبِ الْحَقِّ And you aid the needy. فَأَنَا لَكَ جَارْ I will always be protecting you. These are the very same qualities that Khadija رضي الله عنها said to, uh, said that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have these qualities. The time when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came back from the cave of Hira after the first wahi. She asked him, are you afraid on yourself? He said, yes. He said, remember, nothing will happen to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not any, allow anything to have any, to cause any harm to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then she mentioned these qualities of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that because of these reasons, nothing can happen to you. The very same qualities are in Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, that Ibn Dughunna is talking about it, about it at that time. This is why one of the scholars of Islam have given a beautiful example of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and his qualities. He says, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, if you want to understand who he was, you take a mirror Put it in the in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The image of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that you see in that mirror, that's Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. He doesn't have the nabuwa. But that image of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you see in the mirror, that's Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Beautiful way of expressing these qualities of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu now went back to Mecca with Ibn al-Dughunna. They said, we will accept your protection, O Ibn al-Dughunna, but we will have one condition, apply one condition on him, he is not allowed to do ibadah out of his home. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu accepted that condition. He started doing the ibadah at his home. But Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, as he used to perform salah and recite Quran, his voice was very soft. And he used to cry throughout the time he's reciting Quran, he would be crying. And that, would, that was very impressive. His recitation, then crying during the recitation. So gradually people started learning that Abu Bakr recites Quran at his home at this time. So all the women and children are gathering around Abu Bakr radiallahu on his home to listen to the recitation of Quran. Gradually, this started message started going further and spreading. And there was a large group every day, every night that is there just to listen to this recitation of Quran. And in his crying, they would listen to the recitation and they keep on crying. Now the kuffar of Quraysh were afraid that if this would continue, they are going to lose their wives and their children. So they approached Ibn Dughunna and they said to him, you know, the reason we asked you to apply that condition that he should be doing the ibadah at home so that no one else will see him. But now everyone can hear him. This is how loud he recites. Tell him to re- recite Quran in one of the rooms in his home, not in an open space, so that no one would be able to hear him and in a, such a voice that his voice won't get out of his home. Ibn Dughunna said, this is what these people are saying. He said, no, I won't accept that condition. I give you your protection back. I'm not under your protection anymore, but I won't accept that condition. And here we see, I like to remind these three points about the Quran. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we talked about it in the previous sessions. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited Quran to the kuffar of Quraysh. And how they were impressed with that recitation. Ja'far radiallahu anhu reciting it in the presence of Najashi and all of his people and how they were impressed with it. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu reciting it and how these people are getting impressed by the recitation of Quran. When we read this part of the history, we say it was a miracle. Miracle of who? For Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will find an easy way out. Oh, it was the Prophet of Allah and it was the miracle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What are we going to say about Abu Bakr and Ja'far radiallahu anhu? And there are many more examples, but we have talked about these examples. We have covered these parts of the seerah. 
So now, how come these people's recitation is so impressive? And when we recite, we bring the best person who can recite, and it still is not that impressive. It still is not affecting the people and not having the effect the Quran should have. The answer is very simple, but digesting it might be a little difficult. The reason is these Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een were not reciting Quran to impress others. And you don't find these Sahaba reciting Quran only when it comes to Quran competition. And now this is the only time you would see the person reciting Quran. Or to record their voice and make tapes out of it so they can sell their tapes and say, MashaAllah, it's Qari so and so. Or they are not reciting Quran when they are leading the Salah. And now we are trying to beautify our voice so people say, Imam Ibrahim, MashaAllah, voice is so nice. That was not the purpose of their recitation. They were reciting Quran for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And most of the time they are reciting Quran in the darkness of the night. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala witnesses for them. They used to sleep for a very small portion of the night. Subhanallah. What a witness. And who is the witness? They used to sleep for a very short period of the night. One of the scholars of Islam says that when he, he said, when I read this ayah, I started saying to myself, Subhanallah, they used to sleep for a very short period of the night and we stay awake for a very short period of the night. Totally the opposite. And that is only for those who even stay awake for some period of the night with the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is to remind our souls that Quran has its, has its own nur, has its power. But the time when we recite Quran al kareem for Allah, between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we get ourselves used to reciting al Quran al kareem for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we spend some night, some time, night time in the darkness of the night, standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reciting Quran al kareem If night is difficult, some time in the daytime, but some time when we are standing before Allah and reciting Quran, not to other people, not because I'm leading others and others can listen, not because it's a competition and I want people to hear the beautiful voice. Recite Quran to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only, who is listening to me at this time, who am, am I reading Quran to at this time? I'm reading it only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he's the one who's listening to me. And throughout the time, the person has in mind that I'm reading this Quran to Allah. And at this time, I'm the one who's reciting Allah is listener. This is how they used to recite. And that put that power in that recitation of Quran al kareem Look at the khutbah of Ja'far radiallahu anhu. There isn't anything that we cannot say it in our khutbahs. And we may even say it in more impressive way because we know how to give lectures and we'll say it in more impressive way. And we'll use the speakers and the power of the speakers so that our voice will get even louder than his, his voice was. But none of these things could be, could have that power. The power come from the right sources. You have, you may buy all the lights in the world, but you need the power in the light. For the light to work, we'll need that power. We can have all the knowledge, but for this knowledge to work, we need that power, and it will come only the way Sahaba Ridwanullahi Ali Majma'een got it. This is seerah. This is what we need to learn from the seerah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala give all of us tawfiq to follow the seerah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and benefit from it and give us tawfiq to have that close relationship with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, through which we can understand his life and follow his lifestyle. Aqulu qawri hadha, wa astaghfiru Allah li wa lakum, wa li sa'ir al-muslimin wa al-muslimat, wa akhiru da'wana ala alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka Allahumma wa natubu ilayhi. اللهم صل على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا ونبينا محمد وبارك وسلم
اللهم صل وسلم أشرف الصلاة والسلام على حبيبك ونبيك سيدنا محمد وآله وأصحابه وأزواجه اللهم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وقنا عذاب القبر وقنا عذاب الفقر وقنا فتنة المسيح الدجال اللهم عذنا من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا اللهم يسر أمورنا واشرح صدورنا اللهم اهدنا لأحسن الأخلاق لا يهدي لأحسنها إلا أنت واصرف عنا سيئها لا يصرف عنا سيئها إلا أنت اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه اللهم ارزقنا حبك وحب من يحبك وحب نبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وحب عمل يقربنا إلى حبك اللهم ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم وصلى الله تبارك وتعالى على خير خلقه سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين آمين يا رب العالمين